it's so easy, right? Obviously, you've been doing this for a long time. You can almost immediately realize what a student is trying to do in an application. Uh, ask the dean. We are here to answer your questions. So um, as specific yeah. or as as vague as possible. If you have questions specifically about MAPT, we'd love to get those too. If you have suggestions, complaints about MAPT, I don't know how you can complain about something that's not out yet, but it's it's our uh, outrage culture. Everyone can complain about something, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. That's um, right. So yeah. Um, Scott, so I'm going to, I'm going to lead off with a question here. Uh, yes. A, a question about, um, although being in, let me ask you this. So the, the YouTube video that went out today for me on my medical school HQ page, um, was a, was a video on my thoughts and ideas about how to answer the AMCAS disadvantaged essay. Yes. Now the. TMDSAS application doesn't have a specific disadvantaged essay, but they have an optional essay. Yes. How do you recommend students use that optional essay on the TMDSAS app? So there's there's really three primary essays in TMDSAS. There's the personal statement, the, the, the primary application essay. There's a meaningful uh, meaningful experiences essay which is pretty broad and it basically says if there's if there's something else that you really haven't had a chance to tell us somewhere else in your application uh tell us that and then there's a um then there's an essay on uh disadvantage on uh, diversity in the classroom and and how you would add diversity to the educational experience of that now in addition to that there as as with amcas uh there are there is a section uh, where they want to know about disadvantage. And just like AMCAS, TMDSAS, uh, as well as AMCAS, uh, have a, um, uh, they have a variety of questions that try to get to this issue of uh, disadvantage. Um, they ask things like, do you, are you getting a Pell Grant? Uh, how many kids were in your family? Um, what's the value of your home? What's the... Uh, zip code where you went to, you know, primarily most of your life, et cetera. And the, the, uh, the income of your family, a variety of things like that. So I think that what you're, what you don't want to do as an applicant is you don't want to stretch it too far. You know, you, 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 you have the opportunity here in these sections of the application to really talk about you're growing up and your experiences over over the course of your life thus far. And what they're really trying to figure out is, is there, are there things that have been in your background that have provided barriers to you uh, that uh, should be taken into consideration in the application process? And so if you start writing about some stuff that is kind of a stretch, they're going to know that and they're going to really identify this is, this guy's really kind of, you know, kind of trying to, trying to, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and so I, I think you have to just be straightforward and honest. And uh, if, you know, uh, there's going to be a lot of applicants who really haven't had any disadvantage in their background. Yeah. And, uh, and so I think that in, in that case, uh, don't try to create something that's really not there. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I always joke, right? The, the joke that I, I give with disadvantage, I'm only having one butler instead of two, like all of yes. your friends, that's, <laughs> that's not a disadvantage. Yeah, that's not a disadvantage. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's exactly. something related to disadvantages that actually came up Friday and we weren't able to get to it. So, so yeah. wondering how Facebook. to talk about a learning disability like dyslexia in a way that is positive, but also showing that is as a challenge type thing. Would it fit yeah. into a disadvantaged essay? Oh, I definitely think it would. It would also fit potentially in, I mean, there's a whole lot of areas where you could really go into that. And I, I'm very sensitive to this. I have three children. All three of them are dyslexic. And so in addition, uh, one of my other uh, children, my youngest, is uh, 
got other learning disabilities. And, and so uh, this is a very, uh, this is a near and dear topic to, to me. And so I think that in terms of the application, um, I think that you could really cover it in a lot of different places. It could be covered in the, in a kind of meaningful experiences type section. It could be in the, it could be in the, uh, in the main uh, personal statement potentially, uh, depending on how it impacted your life and how that affected you, uh, et cetera. Um, disadvantage obviously is, is a place where it, it would fit in really well. And all, as with it, as with everything else, it is not a time to whine about this is why I was, you know, had rotten grades or this is why, et cetera. It's not a whining exercise. It is a, a point to say, this is what I learned. This is what I've overcome. But this is what I've learned out of the experience. This is what I've learned about myself, about my colleagues, about my peers, my professors, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, always the value of that experience to you, the value of those uh, 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 of that disability, uh, certainly is something that you want to, uh, to, to really go into. Uh, and, and I, I don't say this is a, uh, not an opportunity to whine. I don't say that flippantly because I think we, we do see those type, types of things in various parts of applications where there's this sort of whining kind of, uh, uh, gestalt that gets, Put out there, yeah. and uh, and and you don't want to do that. You really want to focus on what is the um, what's the value of this, and well, why me, is it meaningful. Let me give you an example, Scott. So what I see a lot is that you have let's say 1,325 characters, right? The, the AMCAS yep. character count yep. is in that 1,325 characters. The student says, uh, after my freshman year of college, I would I was diagnosed with dyslexia. It was uh, something that I, I didn't know I had. And when I figured it out, then I tried to get accommodations and the school wasn't helpful and they didn't give them to me. And I continued to struggle and nobody supported me. And they just go down and down and down and down, right? Yeah. That's the whining that you're talking about versus saying after freshman year of college, I was diagnosed with dyslexia. It was, it was nice to finally have a potential reason for my earlier mm -hmm. struggles. Once I figured out how to... Uh, or once I figured out better learning strategies and coping strategies, right. and study strategies, right. I, I could see my grades turning around, blah, blah, blah. Right. And, and yeah, absolutely. focusing on, on the impact on the positive side versus just complain, complain, complain. Absolutely. And you, you know, the, the interesting and, and thing about it is there will be students that are diagnosed for the first time with learning disabilities in medical school. Mm -hmm. Uh, because some people have learned, some students have learned how to cope so well yep. and learn these strategies to overcome things. But when they get to a, a point like in medical school where it is overwhelming and the information just doesn't, the amount of information just doesn't allow uh, the student to really overcome those, uh, those de deficiencies, uh, then they can, they uh, often get diagnosed. And so, um, so, you know, but I agree completely with what you said, uh, Ryan, definitely. Awesome. Awesome sauce. I like it. Any thoughts on only being able to get shadowing abroad due to scheduling and now COVID? This is an interesting one. So I, I know yeah. one school, I know one specific school, University of Utah, that specifically says they do not count shadowing abroad as shadowing hours. Do you know yeah. any other schools that are like that? Well, I, I think I, I don't know of any others that specifically discount it like to that extreme. Um, I think that what what my experience has been is that w what the medical schools really are looking for, you're entering into an American medical school, you're entering into the American healthcare system. And what they want to see is that you understand what that healthcare system is like. I mean, it's fine if you, uh, shadowed or, or did some volunteering in, in France uh, one summer or whatever. But the French uh, system is going to be a, a radically different uh, system than, than what we have in the United States. And so what I would say is uh, it doesn't replace it. Uh, it can augment it. You, you know, I think that uh, getting those types of experiences in, in other countries can be an amazing, uh, amazing experience. 
Now, having said that, I think you have to be very careful. Uh, and there's been some guidelines that have come, come out probably within the last five to 10 years about what you're able to do and what you should be able to do. There are some really significant ethical uh, problems uh, with, uh, with students who, and, and students love this. They, they go abroad and all of a sudden, <laughs> guess a what? Surgeon. I got to, I got to <laughs> suture a patient or I got to do, oh, you know, I whatever. Three babies. I know. And uh, all of a sudden the medical yeah. schools are very concerned about that. And yeah. if you start talking about that in your essay or in the application, that can be a big, huge problem, yeah. big red flag that goes up. So, yeah. Uh, so, and this, that's what you get often, not always, but, uh, sometimes when you go to third world countries where they're begging for, you know, healthcare providers and, yeah. uh, you go down there on some kind of mission trip or something. And, uh, and all of a sudden the, the doctor's like, oh yeah, come over here, you know, do hold this back or, you know, do this or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, you just have to be super careful about that. Yeah. And I would, I would tell students right, right off the bat, whether you, you go on one of these programs and they let you do it, I still think you say, no, thank you. Right. And yes, there's, absolutely. There's an ethical, the, like if you look at the Hippocratic oath, which it's not in the Hippocratic oath, but everyone assigns it to the Hippocratic oath to do no harm, yeah. right? You, you are a student who isn't certified to do whatever they're telling you or allowing yep. you to do in that third world country yep. only because it's a third world country and the the patients aren't going to say no yeah. that that doesn't make it okay yes right. i understand it's super exciting yes it might be the first time you get to do something like that but just say no yep. it's it's Absolutely. not okay and if you talk about it it's going to be an issue yeah it's going to be a big issue exactly yep i agree Awesome. But shadowing abroad, obviously, usually pretty passive, and there are specific shadowing only experiences. Exactly. But, exactly. Uh, but yeah, there are some schools that aren't going to. But I don't think back to the back to the question, I don't think that's going to replace uh, experience in the American healthcare system. I think that what what the medical schools want to know is that you understand what you're getting into here and now and uh, not what you you know might get into if you were to do Doctors Without Borders and go somewhere else. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So there's always follow up questions with the uh, the abroad stuff. So what about simple first aid type things, right? The <laughs> if, if you're not certified to do first aid here in the states, I wouldn't do it. I I wouldn't country. touch it. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't. I I you know yes. It's as you as you said, Ryan. It's it's exciting. It's cool. It's you know you're helping people. I mean, it's all the things that one would think. Wow, this is great, but. Uh, you know, I think uh, I think there's some real dangers uh, involved with it, and the fact that you don't know what you're doing. Uh, yeah. Then now, if you're an EMT, uh, then obviously that you're certified, you're you're trained, you know what you're yeah. doing, and and that's that's a, or, or maybe you're a nurse or you know some other healthcare provider. Then that's a whole different whole different topic. Yeah. But as as just the typical student, uh, no. Yep. I agree. <clears throat> Dr. Wright, as an older non-traditional pre-med, I am interested to hear your thoughts and reflections about how did your mindset change when you were looking over the application of non-traditional applications? And at what point in the process of looking over apps would you find out an applicant was non-traditional? For instance, was it right off the bat or did you get through some other info first, such as the personal statement? Wow. Um... I mean, I think that often it's pretty obvious. Um, we talked on Friday about how often uh, non-traditional students, uh, particularly those that I think the question even even mentioned older applicants, it becomes pretty obviously obvious pretty quick that um, this is a non-traditional student. Uh, they have uh, their age is is clearly different. Uh, maybe they're 30 or 35 or, you know, 40 or whatever. Um, uh, the, the other thing that can often uh, indicate that is um, they've been uh, to lots of different institutions. Uh, maybe they've been to five or six different colleges at different places around the country. and Or maybe they were uh, military and uh, so they had a lot of different military experiences and stuff. So I think it becomes 
pretty clear, pretty, uh, pretty much right off the off the bat that this is a that this student doesn't fall within the sort of traditional uh, timeline, traditional sort of uh, things that they that a, that an applicant would go through. So, um, having said that, I mean, I think that it, it's not something that is a disadvantage to an applicant to be non traditional. I just think that uh, what the medical schools are looking at is trying to figure out, are you as a, as a person, are you going to fit with our institution? Are you going to fit in uh, healthcare in general? Um, and, uh, and that's what they're looking for. And the, the fact that you're non-traditional really is not, you know, and it's so, it's so much uh, different now than it was 30 or 40 years ago where, uh, you know, everybody was traditional and, and it was a, a big sort of surprise when you got a, a, a non-traditional applicant <laughs> and it was all of a sudden, Whoa, what is this, you know, what is this 40 year old doing? You know? <laughs> but uh, these days it, it, you know, it's, it's very, uh, uh, I think medical schools really see the value of uh, non-traditional students, the, the level of maturity, the level of experience uh, that they bring into the classroom uh, is, uh, is really uh, a great asset to uh, to uh, classes as well as to the institution and in, 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 in a variety of different ways. So let me let me ask you. So something that comes up a lot when especially younger, maybe more. It, it, it seems to always be a more of a political debate is the discussion of should medical schools train older applicants, right? From an economics standpoint, from a, a justice, I think is the. Mm-hmm. the the term of use like good use of resources right if if a student is 45 or 50 applying to medical school they're not going to be able to practice as long as someone else who is younger how much do you think that should play a role in in a decision well zero uh i would say zero uh mostly because it's illegal uh, it's, uh, it, that, that would be, um, in opposition to a, a variety of federal statutes, uh, and, and probably a variety of state statutes, depending on what state you're in. Um, and it, I, I get the sort of, I, it, it's not lost on me, um, how that would be, uh, seen by, by many applicants is, you know, well, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm eight, um, uh, 22 or I'm 23 and I would have, you know, 50 or 60 years of uh, service to my community, whereas this person who's 45, uh, they're not. Well, the, the fact is, you don't know any of that. That this is not this is not knowable information. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so I think that it's uh, you know it is what it it is what it is. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Ooh, URM status. Yeah. We we talked about this a little bit on on National Pre Med Day with the the mission accepted student yeah. who was uh, Iranian, I believe, um, mm-hmm. Middle Eastern, which is considered Caucasian by by our standards for the application. Right. So so kind of a URM in terms of a minority in medicine, but mm-hmm. classified not as a URM. Mm-hmm. So how much does that play into uh, a, a school's? review of an application yeah it it varies considerably by state it also varies uh by whether the institution is public or private um there's a lot of different factors that go into how that might be considered by a medical school um you know obviously uh, all medical schools are wanting to uh diversify their classes um there's tons of research that shows that show that uh, a diverse a diverse class benefits everyone, uh, and it it really does make a big difference in terms of how how things go for for the variety of people that are in the in the in the uh, medical school class. Um, I think that it's a it, it really does depend uh, on the the institution uh, and the the the. I, you know, I remember years ago, uh, wow, when I first went to UT Southwestern Medical School. A Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, ruling had come down, which basically uh, ended all race consideration, race and ethnicity consideration for any institutions in the Fifth Circuit, which included Texas and Oklahoma and Louisiana. And uh, there was a variety of, 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 um, 
of states that it involved uh, there. And so it, it really made a challenge for the institutions in those states to figure out how do we, how do we have a diverse class and how, because the, it's not just about the uh, benefits in the class of diversity. It's also about the benefits to society by having a diverse uh, population of physicians to serve them. Uh, you can look at research across the board that suggests that minority, for example, minority patients are much more likely to be comfortable with minority physicians. Uh, it doesn't mean it has to be that way, but it means that they provide role mo they provide um, uh, role models in the in the community. Plus, they 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 provide a great deal of of uh, effort in terms of how they can serve the population around them. So, I think there's a lot of different ways uh, that schools can do that. But uh, some schools are going to really look uh, very significantly at um, uh, race when they're looking at applications. There are going to be other schools that are going to be completely race blind and will not know anything about it. Now, uh, there's a lot of different ways that that institutions can uh, can provide diversity in their classes. But in terms of URM, I think that it really does vary pretty widely. Yeah, in terms, and just for my state. The accreditation bodies are looking. I remember a few years yeah. ago, uh, Mizzou's medical school got got smacked pretty hard that yep. their lack of diversity was going to potentially yep. cost them their accreditation. So, yeah. it's it's definitely something that that the accreditation bodies are looking at. It's, it's oh yeah, important. absolutely, it's important. absolutely, yep. Awesome. Um, all right, big question here. So, so I our, pinged with Geodi briefly uh, off yeah. in the chat just to clarify. So. Um, she's got her associate degree and is working as an RN now, um, but is thinking about actually ceasing working as an RN. So instead getting her ongoing clinical experience as scribing and volunteering as a Spanish translator. So that's the question is how, how might that be perceived? Okay. So okay. just a, a, a small little thing because I've been working on a, a Spanish podcast is it's Spanish interpreting. I, I learned when I started this uh -huh. podcast, translating is written and interpreting is verbal. So wow, we um, all learned it. We all learned something you know, today. Thank you, Doctor Gray. New. Yeah, bueno, wow. bueno. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. So <clears throat> being a being a scribe, being a medical interpreter, uh, what do you think about that for ongoing clinical experience? Well, I think that's wonderful. I, I I'm a huge advocate for scribing. I think uh, it it provides uh, an and enormous amount of, uh, of understanding and, and of, uh, of information for the for the student that's doing it. But I, I just think the student that is scribing learns so much about diagnosis, um, about uh, the uh, doctor patient relationship. Uh, I, I've seen dynamics teamed. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it uh, depends a little bit on kind of what, where they are, if they're in the emergency room versus if they're in a, in a, uh, a clinic or an office of, of some sort. So it, it varies a little bit, but I think scribing is just fantastic. Uh, big advocate for that. And, um, but I also think, you know, here we have a student who has lots of experience. Uh, this student is an RN already, uh, has a lot of experience in, uh, in healthcare, in medicine. And, uh, and, and so I think that having a situation where they're going back to school and doing uh, scribing and, and uh, particularly interpreting, <clears throat> she didn't really, I, I don't know if the applicant really said what, what part of the country they were in, but, you know, I, I'm in Texas and uh, Spanish is, I mean, for, for a student to know Spanish uh, is uh, crucial. Uh, there, there are so many uh, ways in which uh, a, a um, Spanish speaker can impact uh, the uh, healthcare environment in a, in, in a state like, like we have here in Texas, where so many, so many in the population uh, do not speak English or their English is so limited. So definitely, I, I, I think that the medical schools would really um, look uh, very kindly on, on that, that, those types of experiences. Definitely. I concur. 
Yep. <laughs> awesome. What else? What else? I'm so glad you concurred a lot because if you like disagreed with me, I, I think I would cry or something. I don't know. <laughs> like Scott, where did you hear that? That is completely wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of organization are you running over there? <laughs> uh, let's see. Here's an interesting one for me. As I teach at CU and shoots, I was wondering if you know much about the new Fort Collins campus and if that will be part of the general CU and shoots application or if it's something separate. So yeah, so I, I know a little bit about this. So there is some rumors um, and I think some preliminary kind of paperwork turned in. There's a joint CU, uh, uh, so University of Colorado, and CSU, Colorado State University, there's going to be a joint medical school up in Fort, Fort Collins. Um, from what I understand, it's going to be a separate campus, a separate application. It's going to be a separate school altogether. So uh, that's all that I know about it. I haven't seen any new information other than it was announced as the, a thing that was happening. Uh, but I haven't, I, I looked a few months ago at the LCME accreditation kind of uh, the running list of, of schools that are in the pipeline and, and there was nothing there at that point. So we shall see. That's all I know. Here, I'm, I'm on yeah. the site now. Yeah, it's not, it's still not in there. So still waiting. That, that means it's probably still at least a year or two off. For degree holding non-trads needing to collect all of their prereqs due to timing out, interesting, we'll have to talk about what that means. What do you believe is the best path to collect science credits, post back program or community college concerned about how rigor of classwork would be viewed by admin teams? So. Wow, so the first thing I have to say about this is the it depends on the schools and, and et cetera, but in terms of a lot of schools, they these prereqs do not time out. Yeah, this um, is like one of those long-standing a, myths in, yeah, in the pre-med yeah, world. Yeah, and so you know what institutions are looking, what medical schools are looking for is recent coursework that you know if you, if it's been ten years since you've been in school and then you're applying to med school with no experience in the classroom. That's not going to go well. Yeah. Uh, they're going to they're going to really see that you know you you are not in the mode the study mode, and uh, but so more to the issue of the question I think though is uh, looking at I think what you what you want to do is 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 uh, if you if you have many of the prereqs already the 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 problem is going to be the MCAT yeah. if it's been eight or 10 years since you've had general chemistry, you're going to do, be doing a lot, a lot of review because you're not going to remember any of that. Uh, it's not going to be expire because of, uh, as a prereq uh, necessarily, it's, it's really um, uh, an issue of the MCAT and your preparation for the MCAT. <clears throat> it's also <clears throat> your preparation for other classes. So for example, biochemistry <clears throat> builds off of, uh, uh, off the other chemistry uh, courses, many of the upper level biological sciences uh, courses build off of lower level uh, biological science courses. So uh, I think it's not the issue of get, getting the getting the prereqs again. I think it's the issue of preparing for uh, upper level stuff that you want to take. It's it's pre preparation for the MCAT and um, and. And I think that you have to do that at an institution that's going to challenge you. Now, having said that, you have to consider a lot with regard to your own circumstances, um, finances, a location um, are, are two important things, uh, family support. Um, there's a lot of things that go into these decisions about where I'm going to take the prereqs or where I'm going to pick up this or that course or, or, or things like that. So uh, all things all things equal, if you're doing upper level coursework, most community colleges, the vast majority of community colleges do not offer upper level biological science coursework. Um, so you're not gonna be able to pick those up at a community college. You're gonna have to go to a four year school 
in order to do that. So I, I think you uh, you want to uh, be careful about where, where you're choosing to, to do those courses and uh, but uh, don't feel like they're going to expire or something. But it's, it is this issue of the MCAT that's going to that's going to really bite you if you if you're too far away from some of that stuff. Yeah, definitely an MCAT foundational thing. And and do you even like being a student anymore? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Another test. Yeah. I had a, a student recently. Um, she just emailed, reached out. She, I think, was a physical therapist. Her undergrad classes were and physical therapy classes were 20 years ago. And mm -hmm. she self-studied for the MCAT, didn't take more classes and got several interviews and uh, I don't I'd never heard back if she was accepted or not but obviously yeah. getting the interview the schools didn't care that her classes yeah. were that old yeah right exactly yeah and, and again I I always preface this with is there one school out there that has a requirement that you need to take your your classes within a certain number of years sure maybe of but, course yes yeah there's yes. always that the yeah. the outliers <laughs> yep exactly ooh the dreaded car score. So this is a, another one of those kind of, I don't yeah. know if it's a myth, but just this lore of schools have this cutoff of the subsections. And if I get yeah. a 123 there, I have to retake the MCAT. Cause even though I got a 508, I got a 123, I'm going to yeah. have to retake the MCAT. Yeah. And yeah. on national pre-med day, I don't know if you remember Scott, uh, our, I our do student remember. on National Pre-Med Day had a yeah. 121 in the car section yeah. and yeah. got MD and DO acceptances. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> you know, cars is the, 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 the focus of cars is really, as you would think, it's critical thinking. It's uh, re reasoning and can you do this stuff? It's not, about, it's not about the formula of biochemistry. It's really about can you think through some things and really analyze a question and, and figure out and you guys, I mean, Ryan and, and, and Rachel, you guys know a lot more about MCAT prep, you know, type stuff than I do. But uh, what I would say is, and we, we did talk about this a little on Friday, um, non-native English speakers uh, often have, uh, often do struggle on the MCAT in general, not just on cars. But they they struggle in general. And what I what I mentioned on Friday was if it was the issue of um, of translation. If you're if you're translating in your head or whatever, I I guess that'd be the right word to use, Ryan. Is, is it? Not, I, yeah, let's let's go with it. Yeah. Okay. So if you're translating <laughs> in your written, head, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah. If you're if you're doing that as you read. And you're you're having to translate the what you're reading in your head, then you're going to be much slower, and it's going to affect your score. And so I think that non-native English speakers often and and what I what I try to encourage students who are non-native English speakers to do <clears throat> is to speak English as much as possible. Read, 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 read as much as you can read. Yeah. Uh, and and not just you know. It doesn't have to be textbooks. It doesn't have to be just <clears throat> read stuff. <clears throat> I've always uh, thought that two, uh, there's several great resources for, for uh, uh, helping uh, students in, in general, not just non-native English speakers, but students in general in terms of reading. Get a subscription to Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic Monthly. Uh, this is a great magazine, a lot of different stories, not, you know, <clears throat> there, there's stories about politics. There's stories about s social issues. There's stories about religion or about, uh, you know, science. I mean, they're all over the all over the place. Uh, the New Yorker is another great uh, magazine, as well as some of the, some some newspapers, uh, such as the New York Times or or the uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, are written at a higher reading level mm -hmm. uh, that can really uh, can really benefit uh, students. I think reading as much as possible, and I'll tell you a short story. Uh, when uh, when I was at uh, University of Texas at Dallas one year, uh, I had a student who came in to see me, and he was Vietnamese, and he had. Um, we talked for a while. He had a very very heavy accent. It was it was it was almost it, it was somewhat difficult to understand often what he was saying. 
And uh, so the more I got to talk to him and stuff, the more I uh, began to recognize this was going to be a big barrier, not just by this issue of reading, but also just communicating in general with the patients or, or with an interviewer at a medical school. And uh, so I encouraged him greatly to, and, and what I found out was he, uh, all of his friends were Vietnamese. Uh, he lived in uh, the, an apartment with his brother who's Vietnamese. They, he, he's, he's, he spoke Vietnamese everywhere he went, except when he went to class. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so I told him, I said, you've got to get, you've got to change this. Yeah. This is not going to be helpful. And uh, so he, you know, we talked about it for a while and he, he agreed and everything. And so fast forward about a week later, I'm in the student center and I'm walking. Uh, I think I got lunch or something and I'm walking to, through the, the halls of the student center. And this student is right in front of me <laughs> and he is carrying on a conversation in Vietnamese with a group of people. And I ran up to him and I stopped him and I said, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is exactly what I'm talking about. This is going to be a barrier for you. Yeah. You've got to break out uh, of this and you've got to speak English. And you've got to get it to where yeah. you are, are doing that. So uh, let, me, let me give you a, a very similar story, but is, is potentially this question of uh, like, cultural boundaries and, yeah. and cultural respect. I, I was working with a student who really was struggling with the MCAT and just talking with her and, and discussing things. She uh, was Japanese and mm -hmm. husband's Japanese and they only spoke Japanese in the house. Mm -hmm. And he wanted that. That's his culture. That's the language he wants to speak in the house. And I kept telling her, I'm like, it's going to hold you back. You need to have a conversation with him to uh -huh. say at least for the next three months, four months, until I can take my MCAT, mm -hmm. please let us speak English in the house so I can continue to work on my English. And I don't think yeah. she was able ever able uh -huh. to get him to yeah. to 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 change, which is it's, that, yeah. it's an obstacle. And obviously she had to live with that and be okay with it. And and maybe you you go and you find other outlets to go and speak yeah. English as much yeah. as possible. Yeah. But that's that's definitely Absolutely. conversations that potentially you have to have with either parents yeah. in the house or loved ones in the house yeah. to, to to say, hey Friends, I need whatever. to speak yeah. English. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh yeah. It's not an easy issue. No, it, and it's it's like with everything going on right now, the this mm -hmm. whole like with with race and racial inequalities, we we have language inequalities too. Of mm -hmm. English Absolutely. is this kind of default language, and is it right? Is it wrong? Well, it's just it is. It is. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's just the way it is. How important is having a narrative or theme to your application versus a random mix of activities? <laughs> I love this question. Right? Students, <laughs> students try to get so fancy. <laughs> so fancy with their application. I'm like, okay, this is the narrative I want to say. Like they, they look at the 15, the, the AAMC list of right. core competencies, and they go, okay, right. I'm going to have this theme of I'm adventurous and uh, go getter and inquisitive, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna just gonna pick all of the activities that match that <clears throat> and throw them into my application. Yeah. And then, and then you'll look at the application, and be like, "What is this? Like, yeah, you just throw some spaghetti on the wall." So, <laughs> what are your what are your thoughts with that? No, <laughs> well, obviously I, I, those are my thoughts. Yeah, I know. I completely concur with you, Ryan. Uh, no, I, I think that. Um, it, it, you don't want your application to feel contrived. And uh, my, my concern often with trying to make it thematic or establishing a narrative, as, as the question put it, is that it's going to come across as fake or it's going to come across as not, not really real. You know, what they're trying to figure out is who are you? What are you all about? Where are your passions? What what is it? And and I would say it's it, it's more it's much more often that students are going to be all over the place with stuff, and and I think that that's what the expectation is. And it's not to say that if your if your application, by virtue of who you are and what you've done, is thematic, um, then that's it, it doesn't mean that that's going to hurt you. 
But I, I think if you try to contrive it, it's going to be obvious and they're going to be like, what is this? So yeah. I, oh, I just, I was just created a banner. Hold on. Keep talking. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, don't contrive something. <laughs> don't contrive anything that's going to make you feel that it's going to make you seem fake or uh, it's not going to be uh, the real you. So you have so, to do that. Yeah. So, so Friday, I think it was when I, I put up the banner, the, uh, the, don't go to a quote great school. Go to a school that yeah. will make you great. So here's yeah. here's another one that I have. Show me how you are. Show me show me who you are, not who you think I want you to yes. be. Yes, absolutely, right? absolutely. I think That's too it. many students. And I'll fix the typo there. Too many students, and, and it's just it's so easy, right? Obviously, you've been doing this for a long time. You can almost immediately realize what a student is trying to do in an application yeah. or in a personal statement. And I'll even joke the way that I review personal statements. I start at the, I start at the top and I work my way down and leave comments as I go. And mm -hmm. I've started to go, okay, here's what I'm reading. And I think you're setting me up for this. And then two sentences later, ha, I told you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? And so, and yep. it's just, that's who you think I want you to be or who you think I, I need you to be. And I just yeah. want to know who you are. Just tell yeah. me who you are. Absolutely. That, you know, and that's not to say that I, I do think that an important quality of the personal statement, an important quality of your application in general is, is knowing what you're trying to communicate to, to the reader uh, as with any type of writing. And, and you have to have a good sense of what, who am I? Number one, it's difficult to communicate who you are. If you don't know who you are, yeah. uh, you have to um, think about what am I trying to communicate here? A am I trying to communicate X, Y, and Z? Because I often see applications where it doesn't seem like there's, it, it seems so random uh, that you, you kind of get the idea that this person doesn't even know who they are relative to why they want to go into medicine or, what they've done or with the value of it or whatever. And so, uh, so I think, I, I do think that you have to have a sense of what you're trying to communicate to the reader, yeah. but you, you can't do that in a contrived sort of way. That's going to, that's going to uh, really turn the reader off or that they'll be able to. So it's like some of these formulaic television shows where, you know, you know, after five minutes of the television show, you know exactly what's going to happen at the end yeah. because it's so form formulaic. So, yeah. Um, there's another question here. Will an applicant still have a chance despite academic probation and academic suspension? Upward trends, a dean's list for senior year and post back classes. So uh, obviously for the AMCAS application, I, I forget on TMDSAS if you have to mark if you've had any sort of academic yes. relations or yeah, institutional yeah. actions as they're known. Yes, right. Um, so is that again this kind of a depending on the school right is that an automatic filter out or do no. they give you a second look no i don't i don't think it's an automatic filter out i, I think what they're what they want to know it, more than anything is so for example they want to know when did this occur uh you know was this a freshman year kind of bungle and you sort of recovered and you figured out stuff and, and you and you and you were able to to move on uh and, and improve um same thing goes for uh criminal activity uh so a lot of students are coming into the to the mix with uh, with alcohol violations or you know other things drug drug or alcohol is probably the most typical things and uh and so what the medical schools are going to be looking at is when, when did this occur number one if, if you had an alcohol violation and you were a senior uh, and you, uh, you know, had a DWI, hmm. then that's a lot different than when you were a freshman and you sort of recovered and you, you learned a lot and you moved on. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be a, bit, a, a much different story. Same thing with these academic suspensions and, and probation and stuff like that. They're going to want to know where, when it was. But more than anything, they're looking for, do you get it? Do you understand what happened? And how did you learn from it? Yep. What value did you get from the experience? Yep. And uh, it, they're, they're really going to look at 
how you talk about it. Again, back to the whining thing. If it's a whining issue for you, <laughs> well, my professor did this and he, she's told me this and, yeah. and this happened and my friend, you know, did this and, and it's always diverting. Yeah. Uh, let me, the let me give you a specific, a specific one that a student sent me saying, Dr. Gray, I, I was kicked out of school for, for cheating. And, and I, here's what I wrote. I was falsely accused. I'm like, oh, <laughs> if, if you were literally kicked out of school, then it wasn't falsely accused. Yeah. There was obviously a, a deep enough review. Yeah. You yeah. just got to own it. And, and yeah. what did you learn that's from it? And, that's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. So I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, it's a little bit of a red flag. They are going to investigate it and look at it, uh, but it's not going to be a black ball. Yeah. There was. I was at a conference last year, two years ago, and a director of admissions was talking to a pre-health advisor about a specific student that they shared in common. The student was was the advisor student applying to this medical school, and the student had a uh, like some sort of plagiarism infraction on his record, and he wouldn't own up to it. And the, the school's like, mm. you you need to tell him he's he's got to own up to it, or he's yeah. never going to be accepted. So yeah, it's yeah. just one of those things. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. It's 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 a it's a challenge for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's just just look at our culture, right? You look at the most vilified athletes for for steroid use. The most vilified athletes are the ones that never admitted to it. No, 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 yeah. it wasn't me. I never did it. Blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah, and yeah. you got A Rod who over yeah. and over and over again is like, oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm screwing up. Oh, sorry. And we love A Rod. Yeah. He's an amazing entrepreneur now. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, yeah. and and you have other athletes that still will never admit it. And you can tell. I mean, I'm in the heart. <laughs> I'm in the heart of this. I'm in Austin, Texas. I won't mention a name, but certain bicycle rider, you know, whatever. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. all right. I think uh, I think that's it for today. Wow, Another awesome. Ask the Dean, episode three. Was, Thanks everybody uh, so much for joining us. Yeah, yeah. this has been great. Keep the conversation going. Uh, yeah. Mapped is the the Facebook group is there for you to ask questions, uh, for you to to give us thoughts on what you want Mapped to be as well. Um, we're just I'm so excited. Uh, I I just keep having conversation after conversation with people about what Mapped is and uh, what we're hoping it to be, and they just everyone mm -hmm. gets so excited about it and yeah. they just can't wait for it. So it's awesome. say hi to Wilkie. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I will definitely. Wilkie's <laughs> little Wilkie, Wilkie uh, went to the vet today, so he he's doing okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. All right. Well, Scott, another great episode. Yeah, thank you so awesome. much. And we'll see you again, uh, next uh, Monday. Next Monday, same yeah. same bat channel, same bat time. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. <laughs>